He's known as Baba Booey, and somehow he's become a pop icon in his own right. Well, I yelled Baba Booey at Walter Cronkite's funeral. Baba Booey, Baba Booey, Howard Stern, Baba Booey, Baba Booey. No. Francis. What is Baba Booey? Baba Booey. The name uh, uh, Baba Booey. What, uh, what an unpleasant thing to go through life with. You would do this job forever, wouldn't you? I love this job. It's my dream job. Perpetual. Yeah. It's great. It's great. Every day is something new. It's a lot of fun. I work with people that I love. For the past quarter century, one man has taken heat from Howard virtually every day. His producer, Gary Delabate. I think the people who listen to the show on a regular basis absolutely know who I am. I think it's people who listen to the show on a very peripheral basis or don't listen to the show. You know, you know that, those are the people, the worst people to deal with. He's sort of the more reasonable family guy on the show. I think that if you really listen, that you'll find that about him. We feel we're very blessed with what we have, that, you know, if we are, we should, you know, we have the ability to give back, and we should. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I think that he realized, um, you know, that time, your time here on Earth is short, and you might, you need to make the most of it. I think that um, he was really accepting of his brother and his lifestyle, and he, um, you know, he's accepting of differences, and I think that really translates to our kids. We try to, you know, instill that in them. I think this is uh, my one-year-old birthday. That's my brother, Stephen. Uh, that's my brother, Stephen, and that's me in the back in my little high chair holding my phone, and he's washing the dishes with his apron on. <laughs> my brother, Stephen, was very, very gentle, and um, he was very, very quiet. There's a whole family, which is rare for home movies. It's my, it's the three brothers all together, which I guess was hard to corral us all back in the day. The great thing about him was that we did have a really close relationship. So he would, he would always call me and say, you know, why don't you come into the city? And when I was, so I was like 14 years old, my parents were really cool. I would take the Long Island Railroad. They'd put me on the train. I would get off, go up to Penn Station and wait for him at the information booth and then we would go and do something. I had had this big Christmas party at my house. I must have been up till about four in the morning. And the next morning, my phone rang, it was like nine in the morning. And my brother said, my brother Anthony called, he said, listen, I have to tell you something. And I said, what? He said, you know, Stephen has AIDS. And I was like, it like, I felt like I got hit over the head with a two by four because it was just, even though you can sort of set yourself up to anticipate it's coming, when it actually comes, you can never be ready for it. I had just gotten a video camera like the month before, and it was, uh, it was Christmas. I knew he was sick. I don't think my family did yet. My brother and I did, but we hadn't told my parents yet. And he still looked pretty healthy. And I wanted to videotape him because I wanted to have some footage of him because I knew he wasn't going to be around forever. On the day in 1991 when you got the voicemail from your dad, that said Gary Stephen passed away, was it relief? It was relief. It was relief because at that point, I knew he wasn't going to recover. I knew that he was suffering. When I got signed to do the book and I thought, well, what am I going to put in this? I, I knew that I was going to do a chapter on my brother because it was a piece of me that people who listened to the show knew about but didn't know the story. And I'm like, well, if I'm gonna do this, I wanna tell the whole story. In a lot of ways, I was able to pay tribute to him. I think that had a lot to do with it. Like I could put this down on paper and everybody could know who he was and how it happened. What kind of uncle would Stephen have been to Lucas and Jackson? Well, I know what kind of uncle he would have been. He would have been the greatest uncle in the world. He would have loved my kids and my kids would have loved him. The turning point was a, a very good friend of mine who had a lot of gay friends. She and I went to see a screening of the movie Philadelphia about two or three weeks before it came out. And when it ended, I remember we were like, we were just like shell-shocked. It was just so, you know, it was just so, so much. She had a friend who worked at an organization and we met with him and uh, we put, you know, I, we got involved with the radio station and we got involved and um, I did so well with them. They asked me what I joined the board and that's how I got involved with LifeBeat. And now you're board president. And now I'm board president. We're out to, to educate, 
and talk about prevention and talk about safe sex to everybody, but especially people between 13 and 25. And we felt that the best way, you know, we can preach all we want, but if I could get John Mayer or Jewel or all these rap guys that are out right now or Lady Gaga, if you can get them to say something, you know, they'll be like, well, them, I, I, I respect those people. So that's always been our thing. We've always had the music industry sort of front for us to help get the message out. You raised $200,000 in one event. Tell me about that. It was so much fun. Tonight, on a special celebrity edition of Don't Forget the Lyrics. You know him as Baba Booey, Gary Delavate. He shot Jock Howard Stern's favorite subject of embarrassment. Baba Booey, you're dopey. Everyone in here was laughing at you. There must be some misunderstanding. There must be some kind of mistake. I waited in the rain for hours, and you were late. Tell everybody at home one more time your charity, Life Beat, the music industry fights aid, and they're a wonderful charity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seven nights a week in different hospitals in New York City, Hearts of Voices send people out to entertain people who are in hospitals living with AIDS. You literally can see the pain leave their face or that they'll start clapping along with you. My brother sat in his room for eight months and watched television. The idea that he could have come out of his room once a week to go to a day room where somebody played the guitar. A lot of the people from Hearts and Voices are Broadway singers who work on their nights off. I can't even describe the looks on folks' faces when somebody came to entertain them and do something for them. It's amazing. This is so dear to his heart. You know, he loved his brother more than anything. And uh, this is just part of, you know, him being giving and honoring his memory. Whenever I go out, I'm like, Stephen, what should I say today? And yeah, I, when I do it, it's a way for me not to forget him. You think he's proud of you? Oh, I know he is. I know he would be proud of me. We had a great relationship and, and, uh, and he, was very charitable too. And I think I think if everything were flipped around, he'd be doing the same thing.